When it comes to the cranial nerves, there are two images that most students of anatomy will be familiar with. There's this one, which shows the locations of the nerves relative to the brain and the brain stem. I'm showing you this now to help you familiarize yourself with our schematic model over here. So in this image, we've got the brain stem, which is the medulla, and then the pons, and then the midbrain as well, which in this image is hiding behind the pons. On our model, here's the medulla, then the pons, and the midbrain up top. Now let's grow out our cranial nerves and have a look at them side on. So there are 12 of them in total. Two come from above the brainstem, coming from the brain itself. Two come from the midbrain. Then there are four which come from the pons and then four from the medulla. We'll bring in our skull model now, as well as our second image over here. This one shows our various foramina of the skull which are the holes that our cranial nerves pass through. Removing the parietal bone now for a better view, you can see each of these holes is represented in our model. So just to cover a few of them, there's the foramen ovale there, which is here in our model. There's the jugular foramen there, which is down here. And coming down a bit now, there's the optic canal in our model, which is tucked away in here. And next to it is the foramen rotundum, which is over here. And then we have the superior orbital fissure tucked into the sphenoid bone here. And you can see that here on the image. So hopefully, hopefully, this simplified 3D model will help you to get your head around where the cranial nerves fit into the skull. The anatomy of the cranial nerves will be our main focus in this video and we'll also make brief mention to their functions along the way. So let's get rid of all but our first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve. Its fibres begin in the mucosa of the nose, so there's our nasal cavity just there, and then they head through the ethmoid bone, this one here. Coming through the superior aspect of the ethmoid bone, they exit through the cribriform plate and then contribute to this chunky part here, which is called the olfactory bulb. And then back to the brain they go. The function of the olfactory nerve is, of course, to give us our sense of smell. Number two is the optic nerve, which is made up of neurons that come straight from the retina. So if we look in the eye socket or the orbit here, this is the optic nerve there leaving the orbit through this hole in the sphenoid, which is known as the optic canal. If we remove the sphenoid bone, we can see that the optic canal is making a bit of an angular trajectory there. And then on the posterior aspect, we see the optic canal just there. So the optic nerve then travels backwards to create this optic chiasm. Chiasm literally means crossing in ancient Greek. So there's this crossing here where the optic nerve that was on the left anatomically passes to the right and vice versa from the right to the left. Then past the optic chiasm, this part is called the optic tract, which heads back to the visual cortex via the thalamus. And the function of the optic nerve is to provide us with our sense of sight. Third, we have the oculomotor nerve, which is the first cranial nerve that plugs into the brain stem. So coming out from the midbrain anteriorly is these two white matter tracts called the cerebral peduncles. And the origin of the oculomotor nerve is just between these two cerebral peduncles. It enters the eye socket or the orbit through the superior orbital fissure, which is just here. It's also considered part of the sphenoid, but it's actually just a space that appears between the lesser and greater wings of the sphenoid. So if we follow through to the orbit, we can see the oculomotor nerve coming out here. It controls all of the muscles that move the eye, except for two, which we'll get to later on. And the oculomotor nerve is also in charge of pupil dilation and constriction which, as you may remember from your physiology studies, is an autonomic function. 
Number four is the trochlear nerve, which originates from the posterior midbrain. It's the only cranial nerve to come out the backside of the brainstem. It winds around the side, passing by the cerebral peduncles, and then it also enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. And the trochlear nerve innervates one of the two remaining eye muscles I mentioned before. That's the superior oblique muscle. Number five is the trigeminal nerve, which is slightly more complex. It originates from the side of the pons and immediately forms this trigeminal ganglia from where it divides into three separate branches. We have the ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular. So it's got these three branches and this of course is why it's called the trigeminal nerve. The ophthalmic branch goes through the superior orbital fissure heading to the orbit which makes sense because ophthalmic literally means of the eye in ancient Greek and the maxillary branch goes through the foramen rotundum which is a round hole in the sphenoid bone just medial to the others there. Now if we remove the sphenoid that makes it quite an interesting trajectory as well. The foramen rotundum angularly heading towards the midline. Now the mandibular branch also goes through the sphenoid but through the foramen ovale which is the largest of the sphenoid's holes. If we remove the sphenoid again, we can see that the mandibular branch heads straight inferiorly. It ends up in the mandible, which of course is this bone here. So it ends up in the area of the mandible bone. And each of these branches of the trigeminal receives sensory information from a part of the face. The ophthalmic branch, aka V1, receives this portion of the sensory information from the face. The maxillary, aka V2, receives this part and the mandibular, or V3, this portion. The mandibular branch also carries motor fibers to the muscles that we use for chewing. Okay, number six now, the abducens nerve, which comes from back here where the medulla meets the pons. It enters the orbit again through the superior orbital fissure, which is becoming quite crowded at this stage. So into the orbit it goes and it innervates the last of our eye muscles, the lateral rectus muscle. And this muscle abducts the eye, which is where the name of the abducens nerve comes from. Next up we have the facial nerve, which follows quite an interesting path. It originates from this area called the cerebellopontine angle, which is basically just the junction between the, the medulla and the pons, as you can see here. Its first port of call is to head through the internal acoustic meatus. It then navigates its way through the temporal bone, which is this bone here, and comes out through the stylo, stylomastoid foramen. This is the mastoid process of the temporal bone here. And here's the facial nerve exiting through the stylomastoid foramen. From there, it heads toward the muscles of facial expression, as well as to several glands of the head. So it has a, a real number of different functions outside the scope of this video. Number eight is the vestibulococular nerve which arises just lateral to the facial nerve, also in the cerebellopontine angle. And it also hits the internal acoustic meatus and then splits into two different portions, the cochlear portion anteriorly and the vestibular portion posteriorly. So it ends up heading toward the middle ear, providing us with our senses of hearing, that's the cochlear branch, and equilibration or balance, which is the vestibular branch. Number nine is the glossopharyngeal nerve, which originates close to the olive of the medulla. So that's the olive there. So it's on the lateral margin of the medulla. And it heads through the jugular foramen, which is actually the junction between the temporal and occipital bones. So that's the temporal bone. There's the occipital. And there's the jugular foramen, which is the space between them. And that's where our glossopharyngeal nerve passes through to exit the skull. It gives us sensation in the oropharynx and in the posterior part of the tongue. Number 10 we're up to now, it's the vagus nerve, which originates just below the last one in the posterolateral sulcus of the medulla. It too heads through the jugular foramen and it travels far, which is reflected in its name. Vagus means wanderer in Latin. 
Let's move on to number 11 now, which is the accessory nerve. Interestingly, it's actually formed from two separate roots, one which comes from the spinal cord down there, and the other root comes from the medulla. The spinal root comes through the foramen magnum, which is this large hole in the base of the skull here, to join with the other root before they head out together through the jugular foramen. Its destination is the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles. So whenever you shrug your shoulders, you're activating your accessory nerve. Now, finally, we have number 12, the last of our cranial nerves, the hypoglossal. It comes from the medulla between the pyramid here and the olive over here. So it comes out from between those two and heads through the hypoglossal canal. This part here is called the jugular condyle of the occipital bone and the hypoglossal canal is just a little hole running through that to facilitate the passage of the hypoglossal nerve. And its job is to power the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. And lo and behold, we have covered all 12 cranial nerves now, so let's bring them all in. If you'd like to navigate around this kind of model yourself, you can actually click the link in the, in the video description below and you'll be able to move around it in your browser. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed this little journey. Thanks for watching. Hit subscribe and uh, we'll see you next time.